You are listening to a new episode of Lux and Friends. Today, we are going to speak about money, your money. And above all, how to stop worrying about money. And to stop worrying about money is easier than you may think. And to do so, we have decided to speak with uh, Michael Gilmore, a financial expert and a man on a mission. Uh, his mission is to use this powerful tool of money to teach people how to use it. And he has a formula. He calls it the freedom formula. And it's basically teaching fundamental basics that are accessible to anybody. Keep listening and you may free yourself from worrying about money for the rest of your life. Michael, great to have you on the show. Pleasure to be here. Great to see you again, Carla. It's been too long. Michael, I'm new. You don't know me. <laughs> no, so I'm, very nice to meet you, I'm very, very interested in uh, getting, uh, you know, your opinion on the finance world. Um, contrary to Carlo, who has already talked to you, I, um, I guess I'm one of your students' profile. Wow, that, that's I'm sure not, but that's very kind of you to say to us. Very nice to meet you, Laurence. Thanks. Uh, looking forward to chatting. Michael, you are an investor and a money manager, and uh, your mission, as we speak today, is to promote uh, and spread uh, financial literacy uh, across the world to as many people as, pop as possible. Why is that? And what is your ultimate goal? Uh, that's good. I mean, it, why? Because money is a tool. Uh, it's one of the most powerful tools that humankind has invented. It's behind language behind mathematics, it's probably the next most important tool that we've created. If you think about it very simply, money can buy anything humans can make. We can buy weapons, we can buy healthcare, we can buy hospitals, we can buy education. It can do, money can do anything that humans can do. It can buy that thing. And yet we don't learn how to use it properly. And so we, what happens when we don't know how to use, use tools properly? If you don't know how to use a, a chainsaw, terrible things happen. Uh, if you don't know how to use any tool, terrible things can happen. They are powerful things, but they are not emotional things. They're not doing this themselves. And what I feel we've done with creating this amazing tool and then not teaching anyone how to use it is we've created this amazing power that is really only in the hands of very few people, which isn't useful for humanity. It, the, the, the ability to use that should be in the hands of everyone because we all have the capacity to do it. So we need to teach that. The great thing is it's really simple. There's not a lot of complicated things. So I think we can achieve it quite quickly. Wow, I love this. <laughs> Sounds like you're promoting humanity's uh, human values and, you know, the real spirit of, of democracy. Uh, so I, I just wanted to uh, tag on this one and asking you, you know, financial education seems to be at the core of your purpose to teach people uh, and uh, to spread, you know, the, mm. the power that shouldn't be in the hands of a happy few to make it a universal right. Did I understand correctly? One of the big problems in the world that doesn't need to exist is poverty and and money stress. And these two things combine. It's, people have money troubles. Sometimes that's not enough money, but very often it's enough money and not knowing what to do with it. Uh, and I think the reality is that, that we can fix one of those sets of problems immediately by just teaching people what to do with their money. It will help solve some of the other problem too, not all of it, but it will help some, some of that. And I just feel it's like, it's the most inefficient thing that we do as, as, as a species is have this, this tool that we're not teaching anyone to use and we could use it so much more efficiently. But I just don't see, I see almost no one really knowing how to use it properly. We read your book and uh, refer to your, your past work, especially under the mm. nickname of uh, the $7 millionaire. And uh, we learned, uh, and especially reading Happy Ever After, that uh, financial literacy may lead to financial freedom. Mm -hmm. mm. What is it? What are the basics to achieve financial freedom? Oh, okay. So if I actually, I'll answer that in two ways, because... Sometimes people talk about what does financial freedom mean? And they seem to think that sometimes there's this feeling that it's maybe very money focused because we thought about financial freedom. 
But in many ways, it's the opposite. It's actually being free from worrying about money. All of a sudden, you're, you, know, you don't have to worry about this anymore. You will still worry about all the other things you worry about, whether that is your relationship, your children, your football team. You will still get to worry about all these other things. But finance, you no longer have to worry about. And at the point of where does that happen, it's a very simple uh, number. You need simple, not easy, simple. Uh, it's 25 times your annual spending you need in invested assets of some kind. And the point of why it's 25 times is because you should be able to withdraw 4% of your total asset base every year, investing it for a rate of maybe you know, 3% above, uh, 3 or 4% above inflation, and that should never ever drop to zero. There are a few cases where that does happen, but they're exceptional cases and they can normally be addressed. But that's the, the golden rule, the 4% rule, uh, 25 times. It's not an easy number to achieve. Um, and that's where, actually, let me jump into, that's where the name $7 Millionaire comes from, because that came from a conversation with my daughter, who I wrote Happy Ever After for. And she said, okay, what if I need a million dollars? What's the smallest amount of money I need to save every day to get a million dollars? And... If you only save it, and this was the conversation we had, if you only save it, you need to save $50 a day. Uh, and she looked and we were like, well, I can't do that. $50 a day is a lot of money. I said, but if you invest it and you make 7% returns, you only, need to, you only need to save $7 a day. And then you'll have a million dollars by the time you retire. If you retire at the age of 70 and you work at the age of 20, lots of assumptions, of course. And that was the conversation with her. And that was and that's why I used the name $7 Millionaire, because I saw a light go on in her, you know, in her eyes. She was like, $7, I could do that. That suddenly became within her possibility. And this was six years ago now. Uh, she went through university. She's done all that. She started work. Um, she's been working for more than a year. She saves half of her income every, every month and puts it into investment uh, ETFs and indexes. And that's just perfect for me. I think, you know, that's, I would look at my book as being the most successful book in the history of publishing because I only had an audience of one person and she's doing exactly what I wanted her to do. Wow. I need to get cracking. I also have a 17 <laughs> year old daughter. So spot on. You have, you have the book, right? You have the book. Just exactly. save the book. <laughs> I need to just. My kids, my kids are seven. If they start now, we can talk about the $7 billionaires. It would be a lot more, actually. It is interesting. It would, it would be a lot, lot more. That's the magic of compounded interest. And it's so frustrating that they don't teach it at school. In some ways, it's a, I'm not so bothered about that being taught in school. I want people to learn like the real, real basics. What you have to understand with compounding, let's say if I try and catch, the reason I couldn't actually do what an extra 10 years for your kids is because it is actually quite hard to calculate. All we need to know is that we have to have some kind of indication that you get really big numbers. The numbers you can't believe. Because, I mean, sometimes I'm asked to explain the, you know, the $7 millionaire. I have to use my fingers. I'm holding up my hands because I literally have to count it off on my fingers uh, as I double it. It's not, I mean, you know, it's, it's not easy stuff. I'm more worried that we don't teach it. If we just teach that stuff is possible, people get it. And then they start making the right decisions. And the ability to make those right decisions is what I think should be taught in school. Is that, you know, how... You know, how just once you started saving what you do with it, how you think about it, what's opportunity cost, what's cost benefit analysis, what, you know, what's optionality, these kinds of things. I find it crazy that people don't learn. In, in this current state where we are with this uh, VUCA, you know, volatility, uncertainty, complexity, ambiguity, um, how do you, you know, you seem so calm. You know, you have an answer, an approach uh, to to the world, I and mean, that is not shaking you off. No, no, no. I mean, it's yeah. Obviously, things are uncertain at times like this, right? There's, but one of the things you learn as you learn to invest is it's not about um, the outcome all the time. It's actually about the process. So you keep doing the process right. You keep learning how to do the process better and better and better because the more you add on to these things the more you learn and that's why it's process driven um you're moving towards better goals you're making better decisions so one of the things that i've done in the last two years three years which has been interesting for me 
is to actually invest in new asset classes. And, and as I've invested in them, I've actually had to go back and say, okay, how do you start doing this? What are the basics of these, not just of this asset class, but of any asset class when you first invest in it? And ask myself those questions. Why do I feel nervous? How much money should I be putting in? Where does that process lead? And I, and I think that's what we all struggle with. And you look at these this uncertainty. I mean, as long as you're well diversified if, if you were trading like one stock right now yeah you should be nervous but in that case you should always be nervous that you know that's a crazy way to invest it's if you're running 20 50 100 different positions and and they're all longish term and none of them are geared and none of them are going to blow you up it, the most important thing is that you're in the game right i mean this is one of the things where you know i was talking to someone the other day and they were saying but you know but it's too risky. I was like, okay, what do you perceive as the baseline of risk? You perceive it as zero, don't you? Zero is, ir is irrelevant. It's just, a, it's just a mathematical term. The correct baseline for risk is the economy and inflation. That's your baseline. You have to perform to the economy. Otherwise, you're getting left behind. So zero is irrelevant. And also zero risk doesn't exist. At all. You know, yeah, bury the cash under the mattress. But, you know still at risk your house could burn down right there's always risk but the correct baseline for risk is economy plus inflation and that means investing you've got to be invested so yeah why would i yeah i'm nervous if i'm going down everyone else is going down so it's just asset classes moving around and talking of inflation and mm. I'd like to refer to the magic formula the freedom formula as you refer to mm -hmm. in the book uh, which basically says save invest beat inflation which traditionally was calculated below three percent so if you make four percent out of your capital you never run out of money and you can sustain your lifestyle mm -hmm. without having to worry about money again but now mm -hmm. that uh, that inflation is north of seven percent and god knows where we are heading to mm -hmm. do you do, does this strategy need to change do you need to change the way you approach this i won't um, okay. I mean, uh, from, from my perspective, it's number one, one of the, the reasons why you'd look at a 7% return, just get into the nitty gritty on this. Um, it, it's that level because, as I said, your baseline is the economic growth plus inflation. Let's say you're investing in the S&P 500 and inflation is running at 6 7% long term in the US. Now, one of the things that's going to happen is all the sales numbers of all the American companies are going to go up by 6 7%. If that all just dropped exactly to the bottom line, you're looking at six, seven percent growth, right? So you're actually being slightly protected from, from this. You are investing in the economy and the inflation itself. Now, one of the places that can go wrong is that multiples can drop. So things can get less highly valued, um, particularly something like stock markets. But on those occasions, normally other asset classes pick up, which is why you would need to be in a diversified portfolio. But I would say that, you know, one of the other most important points to this is one of the ways we could be most wrong about that. Let's say I could be most wrong about this is if you, companies stop making so much profit. So there's inflation, but the companies don't make so much profit. But why not? Why would that ha happen? One of the reasons companies make so much profit at the moment is because we, people, don't get paid as much salary. Uh, and that's been one of the massive things that's happened in the last 40 years is we have seen this returns to capital increase and not returns to, to labor. Yeah. One of the things that might happen that would stop profit growth would be wage growth. Now, if I'm purely a saver, this might bother me, but I also work. I'm also a human. I'm also going to be earning salary. So I, I feel that actually one of the things that if I look around the world, most people are geared to their labor cost and their labor inflation rather than their investment inflation. And I would encourage them to invest. Because still, you want to be catching that other wave. Um, so yeah, I, I wouldn't see this as, and also it's one month of numbers, and we knew it was coming, because the US has printed more money than they've, anyone has ever printed in the history of, of humankind. So we knew it was coming. Whether it, whether it stops, we'll see. I want to um, pick your brains on another topic, uh, where mm. there's so much to learn. Potentially, you're going to tell us what is your opinion? Bitcoin. Uh, this is one of the places I'm learning. Um, and again, what I would say with this is I'm, I'm very much, 
I'm a long way away from being an expert. Let's just say that. But what I'm trying to do is a lot of, I see the world being polarized between um, people who know nothing about Bitcoin and say it's terrible and yeah. people who know something to a lot and say it's the next best thing. And there is no middle ground, which is unhealthy. It's really, really unhealthy. It's the excesses. And, yeah. And so it's so one of the things, it's actually the, the last award we put into the Money uh, Awareness and Inclusion Awards is we included a crypto award because I found, well, I found, I know a judge and I, and he very kindly agreed to volunteer to be the judge because I know he understands, he's a, he's a lecturer in crypto uh, subject and blockchain. So I know he understands the, the subject enough. My my simple take on it is if I have no money at all in any form of cryptocurrency, I'm essentially short. If we go back to that discussion earlier on of like you've got to be invested, you've got to be invested in the economy and inflation, and I have no cryptocurrency, am I essentially saying in 20 years' time there will be no cryptocurrency? There will be no use of digitally native currencies online. Maybe we'll all stop going online. That'll just stop and we'll all go back to like working in farms. Is that likely? Or, or is the opposite that it grows 10 times the scale that it is today? That we see incredible amounts of, of blockchain being used, taking over entire industries and the gas that's needed for that driving the appreciation of, of, of coins. Which coins? I don't know. I've got no idea. Um, would it would, would it be Bitcoin? Could be unlikely. Would it be Ethereum in its current shape? I don't know. Maybe, maybe not. I, I'm nowhere near enough an expert to say. But what I would say is to have zero exposure or to have 100% exposure, which is what we hear from people, both of those are wrong. Uh, and we need a healthier attitude towards the education of it. And also to use crypto and the excitement that young people have about crypto to engage them and say, okay, good, well done. Now, what about having, you know, some investments in things that make stuff and things you want to buy, right? I mean, yeah, okay, maybe you only want to buy NFTs, but maybe one day you want to buy the real Ferrari or the real Hermes bag or, or maybe just some real Adidas sneakers, right? You can invest in those companies. You can be invested in the real world. So, uh, and I think there's an opportunity to teach people about that. That's what I'm hoping to see in our awards is, find someone doing exactly that. Can I ask about the Maya, the awards that are, you know, you have this beautiful the, logo behind, just behind you. Just behind me, yeah. Just yes. behind, that way, that way, that way, that way. Yeah. Um, money awards, tell us more. And awareness. Yeah, so money awareness and inclusion awards. So the idea here was, so I've, I've, I've written actually now three books. Um, the first one was for migrant workers uh, called The Thousand Dollar Journal. The second one was Happy Ever After for my daughter. And last year, I wrote a third book, which will be published in a couple of months' time, which is called uh, uh, The Little Book of Zen Money. So it's actually about having a very approaching money through a more Zen state of mind, which is quite hard to talk to people about because most people think, well, I can be Zen, but then I must get rid of money. Or I can have money, but I can't be Zen. Uh, and it's to actually realize that one of the sayings in Zen is that, you know, it's about seeing reality as it is which is so important in money. You know, it's, it's to see money as it is. Don't tie it up with emotions to, to be calm about it. Anyway, uh, as I was working on that and enjoying it, and I enjoy writing the books, and I enjoy thinking about who's reading them uh, and who will think about them, how to help. I was thinking, so, okay, but how many people will this help? I imagined it being a bestseller, you know, because we all like to do that when we're working on projects. Imagine how amazing it could be. It's a bestseller in ourselves, a million copies. And then I did some math and I thought that's like, that's resolving 0.0001% of the problem in terms of financial literacy. So suddenly I thought that's not enough. I can't just be a bestseller. And I, I thought, well, it's never even going to sell a million copies. And yeah, that's only such a tiny solution. And then I thought it's people buying books about Zen. This is not the problem problem. This is like, I'm addressing the one bit of the problem that isn't the real problem. I mean, there's so many poorer people that can't afford to buy books. So I thought, okay, what if, and I had one of those conversations, what if I could do a hundred times more than that? What if I could do a thousand times more than that? What's the, what's the big thing that doesn't exist for financial literacy? And I looked around and I realized that there's a lot of people doing work on financial literacy 
and they don't know what anyone else is doing. They, they invent their own wheels. I've done it myself. When I started out talking to migrant workers, I, didn't, I couldn't find any good materials. So I wrote them all myself. When I talked to my daughter, I couldn't find the right book. So I wrote it myself. And all the time I see this, there isn't an ecosystem for people working in money and, and uh, educating about money and financial literacy. And so then my, my younger daughter, who is not accidentally called Maya, um, <laughs> she's a film student. And before she went off to college, she said to me, we, we, we needed to go and watch Parasite before it, you know, as it first came out. It came out very, very early in Asia, uh, way before coming out in the West. So we went to watch Parasite. And it's a great film. We talked about it. Then she went to film school in the UK. She's hanging out with film students. None of them had heard of it. No one in, in the West had heard of Parasite. But, but then it got nominated for the Oscars. And so I was like, oh, OK, lots of excitement around. They all went to watch it. Oh, that's a really good film. And then it won the Oscar. And then if you look at the box office for Parasite, so much of the international box office comes after the Oscar nomination and after the win. But it's actually not what it did for Parasite that got me really interested. In the middle of last year, Netflix started talking about how the number one show in 95 countries was Squid Game, a dystopian Korean drama. That wouldn't have happened without Parasite. Parasite changed people's perceptions of what they wanted to watch and what they wanted to learn about. And it started to help me see there's an enormous power behind an awards ceremony for an industry to create an ecosystem. And when I look at financial literacy, financial education, I see, I talk of it, one of the reasons that the, the, sorry, the logo looks like it does is you want it to look a little bit like a pinwheel, you know, one of those spinning things, because we want to be the pin in the pinwheel. We don't want to do, we're not big, we're a tiny organization, but there's an enormous amount of demand. There's a lot of wind. There's a lot of demand for people to learn about money. And there's a lot of people doing things. But are they the right things at the right time in the right place? No. You know, the, did you know there's 100 million personal finance videos watched on TikTok every month? Not surprised. Uh, <laughs> 100 million. And it's like, there's so much demand, but are any of them any good? Who's checking? Who knows, right? And so there's, there's demand, there's supply, but no connectivity. And we feel if we can, the, the idea with the Myers is to become that connection and say, this is good. If you are African running a school and you want to teach your kids about money, then we've, there's a program that's doing something similar in another African country, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, and find all this connectivity and make ourselves or replace Google as the only place to go to to ask questions about money uh, and hopefully just, just change that for, for the world. Yeah, it's a big ambition. But we, we'll, you know, just start well, there. when you when you when you say the word Google, <laughs> it's <Yeah>. big. <laughs> so what are what are the next steps? What are the next steps for for Maya? What's going to happen next? So the next step. So we we're open. We're getting entries in. Um, we've had we had more than 50 entries come in in the first couple of weeks uh, from all over the world. Different kinds of people entering. You know, we've got um, school uh, like teachers entering from from india we've got uh, fintech classes coming in fintech apps coming in uh, influencers books all kinds of different things uh, entered in so which is re really exciting to see we've got another month five weeks before we close it uh, at the end of march uh, and then we've got a group of judges who will look at it and and the judges have been really kind we've got uh, people like um amazing patrick jenkins who's the deputy editor of the financial times He's one of our judges. Uh, we've got people running big fintech organizations, like founders of fintechs coming in. We've got academics, um, a guy in Singapore who runs the Asia Pacific Financial Education Institute. He's one of our judges. We also have people that uh, run charities. The CEO of a charity called Aflatoon, which were the people that invented Global Money Week and gave it to the OECD. I mean, there's, and they, they have sort of 300, 400 organizations around the world they work with. So these are all our judges. They will look at the entries in April and May, and then hopefully by the end of May, uh, we'll have some winners picked out. And then we'll celebrate the winners through May and June. But then actually part of what we do is we'll have sort of a two-year, uh, sorry, two halves of the year. 
And the second half of the year, we'll have all these entries, these winners, finalists, that we can then talk to and interview and talk about what they do and promote them through, through our websites, through our social media, and hopefully build that to connect them into other people. So that by the time we get to next December and January and we open up again, we get more entries. And so it builds and builds and builds because that's what that's the pinwheel. That's what we hope we can do is just encourage everyone. Because I, I think most of the world is keen to know more about money these days and they just don't know where to look. Uh, and there's, it's just, it's also, do I go to this website, this website, this website, this website? It's like, and no one knows the answer because they haven't built the fundamentals. And that's what we're trying to do here is just gather so much of the really good information together and say, you could start by looking here. This is a good place to look. Um, mm. I have two final questions for you, uh, Michael. How do you avoid becoming complacent and how do you keep on being happy? <laughs> Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm generally very happy. That's not a problem. I, I, but I have actually have a little bit. It's an interesting question what you asked that, because yeah, complacency and, and, and happiness, people think that if you're always happy, you must theref therefore be complacent. That's right. uh, and so mm -hmm. and so you have to keep turning that yin yang wheel all yep. the time. Um, and I've I've learned from myself that, yeah, I, I'm I'm happiest chasing things. Um, so if I tell myself, oh, you know, I should really be doing that. I should try and do that then that makes me chasing it makes me really happy but also i just love learning new things so that's really easy i mean you know it's always fun to learn new things and that's why i started to invest in these new asset classes that's just really great fun to open up your mind and, and learn new things i have one last question michael and i don't mm. want to give away yet uh, what the award are going to bring but uh, since you mentioned the fact that there are thousands hundreds of thousands of videos being watched on finance every day on mm. tiktok youtube everywhere and anywhere is there anything worth watching or listening or anybody worth listening to for the time being for the people to kind of understand what's going on in the financial world and make wiser financial decisions It's very hard, Carlo. Uh, I'm sorry not to give you a good answer because everything depends on your, I don't want to call it level because that sounds insulting, but you, you need a certain amount of, it all depends on your starting point. And that's why and we'll come back to this is my goal for the Myers is that hopefully we get education systems in schools that teach about money because then everyone starts with the foundations and they start with the foundations properly rather than thinking like, like if I said to you, oh, you should listen to Ben Hunt. I love Ben Hunt, which I do, Epsilon Theory. Like They're not going to get any of it. And that's where we need people to build up and build up and build up that information. If we start at school, everyone comes in on that kind of level. And it would just, it could change everything. Let me leave you with something. I discovered this statistic recently, and this is what I think is really powerful about financial literacy. In 1800, in the whole world, only 15% of the global population was literate. So let's forget about financial literacy. Yeah, yeah, just literate. literate. Just read and write. Um, by the year 2000, it was only 15% couldn't. So we'd gone from 15% literacy to 85% literacy. Wonderful move. It's caused by many, many different factors. Um, I take two things from this. One, well, that's actually only 200 years ago. As a species we've, and a civilization, we've been around for a lot longer. So it is actually very slow even to get to reading and writing. So sometimes I feel I shouldn't be so hard on us as a civilization for not teaching about money because we only taught about words 200 years ago. So let's kind of, we're ready now to, to learn this. The second thing that is more powerful is in the year 1800, global lifespan was average 28 years. And now it's 72 years. And the reason is literacy. And you might want to say it's sanitation, it's healthcare, it's all the other factors. Nurses need to read. Doctors need to read. Absolutely. Pharmaceutical companies need to read and write. Everyone, all these people require literacy. And this is where I come back to what can we do with financial literacy? Because we're, I think we're at one or 2% financial literacy, not 15. Yeah. Real proper financial literacy. What if we could take that to 50%? What if everyone understood the way their money worked I don't know, maybe everyone would just have a better pension. Maybe, maybe they have better savings. But maybe we'd be looking at the planet and saying, I know how to invest better. I know how to do this. I want my money to do this and this and this. 
maybe there'd be all kinds of changes. That is the big ambition to see. Well, I won't be here in 200 years, but that's the big ambition. Things well, could really change. Never say never. Now they are trying to cure aging as a disease. If you listen to people like right. Dave Sinclair. <laughs> yeah, it's true. It's true. Maybe. Yeah. Well, I like your vision, changing humanity for the better. Our, our catchphrase, our tagline, we've just come up with it. We're so new, we're even making up, our, still making up our taglines. Okay. A, make, make money better. Make money better. It was great to have you on the show, Michael. It's wonderful. Thank to be you here, so Carla. much. It's always so much fun chatting to you, Carlos. Really nice to meet you, Laurence. It's so Likewise. always a fun conversation.